uh, I'll dive right in. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski, and for those who don't know, we're all about uh, bringing science, adventure, and conservation to classrooms around the world. I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, uh, Simon Donato. Simon's a geologist, entrepreneur, TV host, writer, public speaker, adventurer, and an ultra-endurance athlete. He's the founder of Adventure Science, so it's a company um, that brings uh, science into classrooms through ultra-endurance athletics as a way of pushing frontiers of exploration. And he's also the host of a show called Boundless, where him and his friends spent 126 days um, trekking around the globe in eight grueling ultra-endurance competitions. So, Simon, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I've been excited to... Uh share some of my adventures with you guys for quite a while. So basically what I'm going to do today is just keep it really simple. I'll give you a little bit of background on what I do. I think Joe's done a, a nice intro here. So uh, yeah, I have a television show called Boundless. So basically we've, we've shot three seasons now. We travel around the world doing tough races. I was in Las Vegas just this past weekend doing a 24-hour obstacle course race. So if any of you have heard of Tough Mudder, uh, they have their championship every year around this time just outside of Las Vegas now. So if my eyes look a little puffy and uh, my face looks a little puffy, it's probably because I haven't slept very much in the past uh, three days and uh, I'm pretty exhausted. I end up going over 70 miles and it's a tough race. But yeah, let's dive right into the talk and I'll, I'll walk you right through what we do with Adventure Science. So Adventure Science CSI is basically a new way to explore our world. So what does exploration mean to you? I want you just to think for a second. When these words pop into uh, the screen here, think what it means in your head. Do you get a mental image? Is there something that uh, you already think of when I'm going to show you some of these words? So Simon, what about... Pop in for a second. Sure. Um, your presentation screen just got put behind the Hangout. Can you just bring it back up to the front? Sure. Look at all these Google Hangout boxes open here. <laughs> you just might have to hit share screen again. Oh, okay. Sorry, my first time, guys. That's okay. Learning. Hopefully the uh, first of many. Yes. There we go. Yeah? So yeah. if I minimize that, we're fine again? We good? Um, when you share, did you share your whole screen or just your um, presentation? Uh, that's a good question. What have I shared here? So there should be an option to share the full desktop. Oh, full desktop. There yeah. we go. And then when you hit play, it won't disappear. Cool. Technologic wizardry. There yeah. we go. There we go. We're in business. Okay, thanks, Joe. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> I'm learning just like you will be today. Okay, so exploration. I mean, you know, this is, this is a big word for me, and when I think about exploration, there's, there's certain subsets to that. A lot of people think about space when they hear the term exploration. You know, does it have to be so far away? Are there true explorers the ones pushing the frontier in places that most of us can't get to? Does exploration only occur in the extremes? Here, you've got a team uh, skiing towards the North Pole. You know, does, does it have to be so far away from where we live in the cities and towns? Is exploration fantasy, with little Dory here running around? Does exploration even exist? Do we know our world too well now? Or is there, are, are there still areas that we can contribute to adding knowledge and scientific information to help make our world a better place. All right, so that's exploration. How about science? When you think about the term science, what pops into your mind? Again, is there a mental image? Is there some thoughts that you have about what, what science means to you? So is this what many of you guys think of when you think science? It's a lifetime in the laboratory, pipetting and doing work like this. Can science happen in the field? Jane Goodall and her little chimpanzee. And this is the type of science that I do. 
this is adventure science. So with adventure science, I took an idea that I had while I was working on my PhD. Um, I guess I'll give you a little bit of back uh, backstory there. So I have a PhD in geology, which is basically studying rocks and uh, a little little bit of uh, fossil paleontology work in there. And I did a lot of walking around during my PhD. It was a field-based project. And while I was walking and exploring these areas, I would find so many incredible things that would help me get a better understanding of what was going on in the area and help tell the story better. At the same time, I was doing a lot of racing, like the type of racing I did this past weekend. So I was fairly healthy and I could be out for long periods each day without getting grumpy or hungry or sore. So the adventure scientist now is combining somebody who's got a certain level of fitness and can go for a nice hike through the forest or the mountains with scientific research and analysis. So here we've got Winter and Jane. This was a project that I did over a year ago down in the mountains of California where we went in search of a number of airplane wrecks. So throughout the mountains of California there's hundreds and hundreds of crash airplane, military airplanes and private airplanes and there's still quite a few of them that are unaccounted for. So we have certain targets that we've been able to spot on satellites and that's what we're doing here. So we verified this wreck was a military wreck and it crashed during World War II when uh, the pilot was training in this particular canyon. But there's not a lot of people who have seen it because it's not an easy spot to get to. So adventure science takes our scientific concepts, blends it with fitness and takes these teams out into the field all over the world. Oh, and I should say that winter at the time of this photo was 15 years old. So probably not too far off from where you guys are. So now I'll quickly burn through some of the projects that we've done in the past. This is a photo from Chile. This is the Atacama Desert. If you've ever heard of uh, the Atacama, it's the driest desert in the world. There's some spots that have zero recorded historic rainfall. So airplane hunting is something big that we've done. And it's really how adventure science got started. In 2007, there was a very famous pilot who vanished while he was flying on the edge of Nevada, California. And I got interested in that project because the teams that were looking for him, the search and rescue crews, just didn't have the same level of fitness that I thought it took to find this airplane. So I pulled a team together. We went down there. We didn't find it. We actually came very close. But it started us on this path of finding airplanes. So one of the things I learned very quickly is that it's important to be a very good observer. Any scientist starts with being a good observer. It's not about understanding math or chemistry or biologic principles. It's about having a curious mind and being able to observe differences. So this is a little training exercise. We're going to find this airplane wreck. This plane crashed about 40 years ago. This is on the edge of California in the mountains. And the wreckage is scattered in the hillside. So take a good look at this photo and think about what you might be looking for to find a wreck. Do you think you see it? How about now? Anybody think they're getting close? What's, what's one thing, what's one thing you, you might look for to help you hone in on an aircraft rack from a distance? So, Mr. Cameron, I turned your mic on. What's one thing you guys think you might look for? Keely? Oh, Keely said little parts of the plane, right? Uh, light reflection. For sure. Uh, yeah. Brighton says reflection from the metal. Very good. So those are two keys. Very rarely do you find an intact airplane. Uh, it does happen, but oftentimes you're finding parts. They no longer look like the airplane, and it's metal. Sometimes these planes burn, and it changes the, the characteristics of the metal. So it's less reflective. But reflectivity is a very high one. So again, take a look at this photo. Take a mental image of where you think uh, you might be seeing some wreckage. We'll zoom in a little closer. Do you still have uh, have your eyes on that same spot? Anything standing out? 
Maybe someone want to describe where they think they might see some wreckage? So Mrs. Cowley's class, your mic's on now if someone thinks they might see something. I think I see the wreckage on the side of the hill where there's a little reflective white light. Uh, yeah, give, give, it's on, the, on the side of the hill where there's a white reflective light. White reflective light. It would, is, that, is that on the side underneath getting or the side underneath closer? Getting. Okay. And maybe halfway down or where? Halfway down, he says. Okay, cool. Well, this is what you saw halfway down. And yes, that is a piece of the fuselage. It's very reflective at this time of the day. We were hiking in around 09.30, oh, 10 in the morning. And this airplane in particular had 40 people on it. Um, it was a movie airplane, so they were heading back to Los Angeles after doing some filming out in this area. And unfortunately, with some uh, poor weather conditions, they weren't able to clear the summit. So if I can back up, the main wreckage is basically, if you see the three uh, periods off the R and go across from there, it's, it's in that little V. Well, basically, it's under the R and under the, the periods. So the plane almost cleared that peak. But the wreckage will tumble down over time with snow and, uh, and other natural forces. Parts are going to move down. So the first piece that I stumbled across, aside from seeing this reflectivity, was a wheel from the landing gear. And that was several hundred meters down slope. So things can move around. And again, they're, they're not always going to be consolidated and intact. So good work, guys. So this is what the crash site looked like. Um, there I am with the wheel. That's quite a ways down the slope. This is uh, in the upper right-hand corner is melted metal on the rock. So obviously airplane fuel when it burns can be extremely hot. And in the lower right, it uh, looks more like a burned mattress than it does an airplane that used to hold 40 people. So again, a lot of these, the, um, the investigators, the federal investigators will remove parts of the airplane but um, oftentimes there's, there's quite a bit of wreckage left behind, especially if it's more remote. Okay, so hopefully found that interesting. Um, here's another project that we did. This is where I did my PhD in Oman. So I went to school at McMaster University in Hamilton, and my field area was, um, I don't think you can see the cursor here. Maybe if I do it this way. Okay, so Oman, is up here. If you can, can you guys see that cursor squirreling around there? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So that's where Oman is. It's in the Middle East. It's a desert nation. There we are getting a little closer to it. So it is everything right of the red line, which denotes uh, the countries of um, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, uh, the UAE is to the north as well. And across the channel is Iran. So uh, there's also a relief profile on this one. White denotes the higher peaks and green is towards sea level. So if you look right to the top, I always think of Oman like a thumbs up. So you got your knuckles off to the right and you follow the mountain chain as far as you can to the north and that's the tip of your thumb. That area is called the Musandam Peninsula. This is what it looks like on a Google Earth satellite image, which really is the only good map we have. It was mapped by uh, Russian explorers in the 30s or 1930s or 40s. That map's not great. So I wanted to explore this area. Um, it gets very, very little traffic. And there's certainly no Westerners like us who go inland in the hinterland here and explore. <clears throat> so this is the map that I had to go on. and before I went there though, I knew that there was rumor of numerous archaeological sites and villages up in the highlands. So let's see. So last um, slide, when we were looking for airplanes, I had you guys hone in on what you thought might stand out for airplanes. Reflectivity, um, small parts scattered about. So now, I'm in a desert, there's very little uh, vegetation cover, and I'm looking for archaeological sites from the air. So I want you to think about things that you might see that pop out 
and that aren't natural features. So when you think about how people build buildings, make roads, um, have farm fields, build livestock pens, whatever people may do, I want you to think about uh, that when you're scanning these pictures. So we are, if you look in the right corner of the photo, the little uh, thumbtack that says Da Sunni, we are in that area, right here. All right, guys, scan the photo. What do you think we're looking for here? Mr. Cameron, I have your mic on. Anybody? Carson? Um, you're like closest to the bottom. I can see like weird like scrape marks and it looks like that's maybe where it hit like hard into the mouth. Like and that's where it like how it like that's how it feels like the plane has plane wreck. <laughs> no, I think we're off of plane wrecks. What are we looking for, Logan? Logan says left middle. It looks mm -hmm. like there, there's a little formation, a rock formation that kind of sticks out. Okay, good, good. Color is huge when you're looking at uh, images like this. Um, so uh, on the left side, um, I can't confirm whether that is something or not because I didn't visit everywhere here. It's very, very mountainous comes straight up from the ocean and there was a lot of rock climbing involved. But yeah, when you're scanning these pictures, the first the first the first thing I the first thing I do now I understand geology, um, since it's what I did for a long time in school. So I look at the terrain and I'm looking for areas that people might build. All right. Are they building on some flatter areas? Um, what is that wiggly line there? You know, along the left side you can see a bunch of bands. Well, those are geologic bands. Of, of rock, limestone, actually, as they just pop out. So, you know, I try and use the knowledge I have, but then, again, come straight down to observation. So color is a huge one. Is there anything else, guys? What do you think? Mrs. Pally's back. Oh, my gosh. 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 Oh, my There's a little shiny rock in the center, in the center, like where it gets thin. Okay. Very, very good. Shiny rock in the center where it gets thin. Well, keep your eye on that. And remember, we're thousands of feet above the surface, so we're going to start zooming in now. Okay. Is that still the same area you were looking? That's still the same. Yes. Yeah. All right. So describe it a little more uh, closely now. What exactly do you think you're seeing there? When there's a thinner patch, the direct center there, there. It looks like a. It looks like a. Okay, guys, well, I know uh, what you're looking at. So when I'm scanning these photos, too, I look at the terrain. Is it steep? Is it flat? Would somebody build there? What are the building resources of the area? That requires you to go a little bit deeper. Here, I know it's primarily rock. So that's going to start telling me a little bit of information or giving me some information on what I may be looking for. Um, what's, what's the purpose of the, uh, the structure? Is it a village? Is it defensive fortification? Oh, sorry, the resources were, are we close to water? Um, is there an area where people can gather food? And then what are some of the other questions that might pop up? This is whatever you might think of. Okay, so looks like we've honed in on the spot you were describing. So if you look at that area down there, to me it looks like a little coffee bean. It's um, got a ring around it. It's oval in shape. Maybe it's a hamburger bun. And then there's uh, a line through the middle of it. It's, it's going northwest, southeast in direction. And if you follow that line, or if you follow the center line, now it may not be great on your screens, but there's a very, very faint line that continues off to the northwest. If you follow that line, you're going to go to 
some interesting structures that look rectangular and they're all clustered together just on the right side of a rock band there. Do you guys see that? It's pretty faint, yeah. yeah. Pretty faint, okay. Um, so there's another shot of it. Is that a little better now? You think Mr. Camera's class, can you guys see it? Can you guys see it? Yeah. Yes. yes. Right. So when I was looking, I had no information other than what was on Google, and this was the first thing I saw, this little guy down in the right-hand corner, which I call the coffee bean, only because I'm drinking coffee right now. Um, this is what it looks like in real life when we got there. Uh, we end up putting our tents in there, and it turns out that this little ring was an area that they had cleared for agriculture. So they were growing crops in there. The second thing I saw, which drew my eye up here because this was very hard to see for me at first, was an ancient path that follows all the way up in here. And then you've got 10 to 20 plus buildings in this area. And it's very cool because it sits there's there's a high rock ledge on this side, high rock ledge on that side, so it's very difficult to see this village from the water. So it had a nice defensive uh, position as well, which I thought was awesome. Beautiful area. So this is the path, if you can see it here. You can see where our tents are in the center of the photo, and then we had to come uphill. And I'll tell you, it was a lot easier to see the path on Google Earth than it was to follow this in real life. So sometimes the satellites give you a better perspective than when your boots are actually on the ground. But this is what the area is like, and if you can imagine, people were eking out an existence in some place as dry and remote as this hundreds of years ago. This is what some of those buildings look like, the rectangular structures made out of big limestone blocks that are all over the place in the area. Uh, this is my friend Jim, and I, he was exploring this area with me. That's our Explorers Club flag. And these are some of the artifacts that we uh, took photos of. They were laying around. So again, this village uh, has been deserted for hundreds of years now. Um, there's no research that goes on there. There's no Westerners that visit it. It's not part of the tour route. Uh, because there's a lot of people who scuba dive in the area. Nobody gets up to see this, so we very well could have been the first people, first Westerners for sure, in, in a long, long time to have ever seen this village. And the pottery that the people used to use is just laying around on the ground in abundance. So very, very cool to explore these areas because you never know what you're going to find. Oh, the other thing about the pottery too is if you look at the different styles and textures and designs, it's going to help you come up with a date for it because the pottery is like fashion. People would change the pottery styles over time and you can pin it to a relative, uh, to a period of time based on the designs. These are some of the animals that we saw in the area. Goats and snakes, that's pretty much what we had to deal with. And the snakes are poisonous there. They're vipers, so you definitely have to watch where you're going. This little kid is up in an acacia tree. Um, they, they chew, so they eat all the leaves underneath, and that's why they have the funny shapes here, and then the little guys get up top, and then they eat the leaves there too. So they definitely know how to survive in these areas. How are we doing for time, Joe? Uh, good, yeah. Good, yeah. If you want okay. to go for a few well, minutes, we'll do some questions. questions. Yep, a couple, uh, couple more slides here. So guys, the last spot that we went to was Madagascar. And this is uh, an island off the coast of Africa. It's down here, one of the largest islands in the world. And has everybody seen the cartoon Madagascar, the Disney movie? And the movie. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, the movie's got a few differences from the actual uh, island. Uh, but the island is a very special place, and that's mainly because of the uh, lemurs that live there. And those only live on Madagascar unless they've been transported to, to zoos or other places around the world. Um, so what we did was we wanted to go in there and find some dinosaur tracks, do a lemur survey, find some new caves, 
and explore an area that has been unexplored to date in a really remote section of the country. So first thing we did, we had to hire an airplane to transport our team out there. You can see that up there. And if you look at the island, uh, that little dot just um, above the M, that's where we went. Now the capital city is, if you go straight across the island in the opposite direction, is on the other side. So it's a couple hundred kilometers away. Now, what makes the area interesting for me is the type of forest there. So Madagascar, unfortunately, has a severe deforestation problem. They graze a lot of cattle there, the villagers do, and in order to graze it, they burn forests down so that they can grow grass. What makes this area special is that you've got a strip of forest which heads north-south for a couple hundred kilometers, and this is one of the largest stands of tropical deciduous dry forest left in the world. So it's a type of forest that is being rapidly cut down, and it's important that it's preserved here, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to go out. So if again you're looking at the map, you can see Madagascar just off the uh, southeastern tip of Africa, and you can see that little green swath on it. Those are areas where there's tropical dry forest. So this is the reason why there's still forest there, because it grows in this incredible rock formation, this limestone rock formation that is pretty much like a fortress. Once you get into it, it's like a labyrinth, and on top, you've got all this spiky rock. Then Singi translates to place you can't walk barefoot in Malagasy. So these photos were taken when we were just having some fun after the project at one of the parks in the area. Uh, definitely not for the faint of heart, taking all these rope bridges across, because if you fall, you are not going to have a very good day landing on those spikes. But because of it, people can't get in. So this is the area that we were working. Um, there's no maps. Nobody had explored it. We didn't have people to show us around. We had to figure it out as we went. So that meant squeezing through these crevasses. Um, this is George. Uh, you guys have, have, have done stuff with George, right? We have, yeah. We had one we had one about a week and a half ago. We hung out with George. Yeah, that's Storm Chaser George Karunas having some fun hanging off of uh, the limestone there. So this was a cave that we found. Turns out that this is the third largest cave in the park now. It's in the top 30 for the country. This room to the right is just one of the many chambers that we, uh, we explored and mapped out. We call this one the Elephant's Tusk or sorry, elephant's trunk, because it uh, looks like an elephant's uh, trunk hanging from the ceiling there. And that's Travis Steffens um, looking up, so I know you guys have, uh, have had a few chats with him. But again, this is one of the reasons why I do adventure science, because nobody does any research there. The uh, government, unfortunately, can't fund their own park staff to explore and research the area. So we were the first people to come in and discover this cave. Now we've given the maps and all the information to the park staff and they know it's there and they can do what they want with it. But knowledge is power in a situation like this and now they've got more information on what's going on in their backyard and their national park. And that cave turned out to be over a mile long. So speleology is the study of caves and here's just a few photos of us inside the cave. I mean, the, the artistry of the rock, as you get all this different type of limestone um, precipitating and dripping over time, creating these incredible uh, formations, it, it's just beautiful. So that's what we're looking at through here. And yeah, caving is not for the faint of heart, especially in a place uh, where rescue is very, very difficult and may, uh, may take quite a while. So we, we do things very safely to the best of our ability, but there still is a little bit of risk when we go in there. Okay, so we did some caving, then we did some paleontology. So I knew from reading uh, academic reports that dinosaur tracks had been found to the south of where we were by about 20 kilometers. So I wanted to know if we could find them in our area and extend the range of these tracks because for paleontologists, finding these trackways gives insight um, to what life was like during the Jurassic period when these guys were walking around. So these dinosaur tracks were made by theropods. Um, they were made by a medium-sized predatory dinosaur, bipedal, two legs, 
and they were basically like velociraptors. So these three photos show the two on the left show the individual tracks. The one on the right, the larger photo, that shows a trackway. So here, there was a number of tracks preserved, and what would have happened hundreds of millions of years ago was this theropod would have been walking along basically a beach with low tide. He would have gone out, or she would have gone out, looking for a meal. So when the tide goes out, sick injured animals get stranded out there sometimes. There's tidal pools, and they'll go out for easy pickings and uh, do their hunting out there. So that's basically the behavior that we're seeing represented in the rock here. And that's what the track maker looks like. So you wouldn't want to be uh, stuck on the tidal plane with this guy coming after you. And some of the other things that we didn't saw, well, we found an archaeological site in our area. This is uh, a storage pot, and it's a couple hundred years old. It's a bazimba is the type of people who used to make that. And we've got some lemurs that we saw. So the lemur work that we did, we do it during the day and the nighttime because some lemurs come out during the day and others only come out at night. So that was very, very cool to see because lemurs, as you may know, are under threat. Here's a few more lemurs that we saw out there. Cute little guys. And these guys, when they're on the ground, their running is very hilarious. They'll, they'll be upright on two legs, use a tail for balance, and they're close to a meter high when they're standing up. But the Deccan Safaka is a beautiful lemur. And this is the team. So that's it, guys. Uh, if there's time for questions, I'm glad to answer them. But really, to be an adventure scientist, all you have to do is be an observer. You look, you scan, you notice differences. You have a curious mind, and you're on your way to being an adventure scientist. Thank you very much. All right. Awesome, Simon. Um, so what we'll do with our two classes is we'll start with Cowley's class, Cowley's class, and you can start with two questions two questions for Cameron, Cameron, and then maybe we'll do a final question for me. Can you get me? I didn't hear that. Oh, <laughs> do I get claustrophobic in the caves? Um, a little bit, yeah. So with that big cave system, there were two areas that uh, were were pretty challenging. One we one was a partially flooded uh, passageway, so it would have been maybe a meter to a meter and a half high so we're already having to, to bend down for it and there would have been about 20 centimeters 30 centimeters of, uh, of space, airspace, and the rest of it was water. Um, there's no maps, nobody's ever been in there so we had no idea what we we're getting into so and obviously it's pitch black so excuse me all you have is your, is your headlight to give you la light and uh, yeah that, that was a little bit scary um, we were all tied together in that case, uh, just in, in case it dropped off, um, because you know we thought it was a certain consistent surface. But yeah, that that one was uh, was very scary. We had almost everybody in there, and there was another one where, you know, you're doing your commando crawl on your elbows and pushing dirt and rock out of the way to get through, and. Yeah, that's that was pushing the edge of uh, what I found acceptable. I was almost ready to turn around in both cases. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, Caitlin, go ahead. Um, um, place that you've ever been? My favorite place that I've ever been. Wow, that's a tough question. There's so many beautiful places on this planet. Uh, for starters, I love where I live in the Rocky Mountains of Canada. It always makes me happy when I come home and I see those mountains. They're so beautiful. I really do love deserts, though, uh, in part probably because uh, I'm a big fan of geology. I like being able to see the rock and having big views. Um, I think Zion National Park in Utah is definitely up there for one of uh, the most beautiful places that I've ever been. I spent some time in one of the uh, sand deserts, uh, the sand seas, 
in Oman. It's south of where, where we did that Mussan Dam project, but it's just gigantic sand dunes as far as the eye can see. And when the sun comes up or the sun sets, uh, just at dawn or dusk, the colors that are reflecting off the, uh, the sand grains are just incredible. They're red and pink, and it's, it's very beautiful. Um, a lot of solitude in places like that. So I've definitely had some good moments out there in, in deserts for sure. All right, good question. Right, good question. Uh, Mr. Cameron's class, I know your class always has some good questions. What do you have for us today? Today. Okay, first of all, I just want to thank you to Simon. We're going to ask two questions. Please stay off. Stay off. Thank you. Thank you. We're getting we're getting back over the mic today. The mic today. Try to get nice and close. Nice and close so we can hear. Um. So, so that watch, watch. That if your mind breaks, then your body will follow. What would happen if your body breaks? Will your mind follow? <laughs> no. Um. Yeah. If your mind breaks, it doesn't matter how how good you're feeling. If you give up on something, you're done. If the body breaks, you'd be amazed at how far you can you can push yourself along if your mind stays strong. I mean, if you think about, if you've ever heard of these amazing survival stories where people are left behind because they're so badly injured, but they've got the will to survive despite broken leg or broken back, and they literally drag themselves out of the mountains or the forests. Um, you know, I would I would say that uh, the mind is is the most important tool. So if you can keep your mind strong. You can do anything. But great question. All right, great question. Right, great question. Uh, do you ever, do you ever, ever souvenir home when you find one? <laughs> Souvenirs, um, sometimes, but um, usually there's there's laws for these countries that don't allow you to take things from the field. So for example, that, that pot that we saw, or those pieces of pottery in Oman, the pot from Madagascar, we would leave those behind because we're not supposed to take them. And you know, part of it is I really enjoy finding things and I want others who travel to the same area to be able to, to make these discoveries too because it's a, it's a really good feeling. So yeah, I don't, I don't typically take souvenirs from the areas that I go to visit, but I'll definitely buy things from the markets afterwards for nice little mementos from myself and my friends and family. Good question. All right. Let's All right. visit, Let's visit um, our grade sevens our again. Sevens again. So they have a final question for us. What was your greatest discovery? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. What was your greatest discovery? Greatest discovery. That's, uh, that's a great question. Difficult. Um, I think in Oman, that uh, first village, the ones that I was showing you or the one that I showed you photos of, that was, that was huge because I, I went through it exactly the same way you guys did. I looked at a Google Earth image and it looked like there was something different going on there. But there's no other reference to it anywhere. I didn't know whether it exists or not. And I literally hired a boat, had them drop us off, and they were going to come back in two weeks. So if I was wrong, we'd be out there for two weeks, and uh, it would have been a pretty big mistake to make. And we didn't know what the terrain was like. So there was a lot of challenges going into that area that um, thankfully it worked out for us. So that was very exciting, finding that village. And then... Once I found that, I knew that the other areas that I had selected on the map were going to work out too. Uh, the the other one was in Madagascar. It would have been it would have been finding the dinosaur tracks. The cave was awesome, but I, I kind of had a gut feeling we were going to find a cool cave out there. So it was the dinosaur tracks, and in part because it wasn't me who found them. So I'm a paleontologist. I did my master's in paleontology, and um, when we go to these things. The, the goal is have 
more eyes and ears on the ground, right? It's not just the expert leading and saying, well, everybody, this is this type of lemur, this is this type of dinosaur track. I want everybody observing the, full, the, the whole time. So what makes the dinosaur find cool was that it was Jim Mandeli, my friend uh, who was holding that flag with me, who found it, and I had actually walked over it. So we were walking up this old riverbed that was dry at the time, and I saw something in the rock. I took a look, and I thought, ah, nah, couldn't be it. The photos that I'd seen before in the other papers, they looked too different. And then Jim says, hey, Simon, what do you think about these? I thought, well, all right, what the heck. So we go back, have a look, and they're looking pretty crummy. But then we get the ruler out, and we measure the size of each one, length and width. Then we measure the spacing between each step, and it was all consistent. About 40 centimeters long from heel to toe, and then 30 centimeters wide. Um, this, the distance between each step was around a meter. So at that point, I knew we were dealing with dinosaur tracks, and I had missed them. So for me, that was very exciting because Jim, who's not a trained paleontologist, he's an engineer. He's never really done anything like this before with, uh, with dinosaurs. He saw it simply because he was looking, scanning, and just noticed something different, much like when you guys were looking for the airplane wreck on the hillside or the village in the, in the desert in Oman. So that's why the dinosaur track was very cool for me. Okay, well, that's good. It brings it right back to an important part of science is being a good observer and being aware of your environment. Yep, it doesn't happen in the lab. It happens outside, too. Well, Mr. Cameron's class had to duck out. Their period ended. Their period ended. So, All right. So I want to thank you, thank Simon, you, for Simon, obviously, obviously um, taking the time um, to hang out with us. After, hang out with us. After, visit, after, after, visit after, after. Um, I want to thank Mrs. Cowley's class for joining us. Grade sevens. So you guys had some awesome questions, and um, maybe I'll just turn the mic on one more time so um, the class can say goodbye to Simon. Thanks for listening, guys. Have a great day. All right. Thanks a lot, Simon. Thanks, everybody, for joining in, and we're going to log out for now. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Joe. A lot of fun.